incredible wife, godly mother, and now godly nana to affect the life of a grandchild. And so I'm thankful for that. And I tweeted out a picture of my daughter in love. I won't call her daughter in law, she's a daughter in love. Because she is an incredible wife and mother also. I called my last living mentor's wife. Now that's getting to an interesting place in life when you just have one living mentor. But I called Mother Shepherd, uh, Bishop's wife in uh, Bethel United Pentecostal Church on Long Island this morning because I wanted her to know how much I appreciate as a young evangelist when she took me in and they just made their home my home while I was an evangelist on the East Coast for Campus Ministries, cooked meals for me. I didn't even realize, just like most of us grow up, not realizing all of our that our mothers are doing for us. We have to become adults with responsibilities of our own to finally realize how much they gave, loved, and sacrificed in so many practical ways. And in the case of many of our mothers' spiritual ways, if they were godly mothers. So I wanted to let her know that I appreciated her for the spiritual motherhood she has given in my life. We have a wonderful mother coming right now. My wife was scheduled to preach this service, but she has come down with a severe kidney infection and has to stay off her feet till that is better. But Sister Lori, the Lord had already started talking to her, and when I realized Sister Walker was not going to be able to do that, I called and she graciously uh, accepted the call to stand in and preach the word of God on this Mother's Day to us. And let's just, as she's coming, let's lift our hands and thank God for every mother and what they have affected for the propagation and the continuation and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and thank you and worship you, Lord. We appreciate, Lord all that you are doing, all that you have done, how you are working in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for godly mothers, Lord. Thank you for what they have meant to our lives and what they have meant to your church. I thank you, Lord, that it's a wonderful generational transmission of truth and godly priorities through our mothers in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. I won't keep you standing long, but I just wanted to say first thank you to Pastor for asking me to speak. And happy Mother's Day, Sister Walker. She said she was walk watching, so everybody turn and say happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Sister Walker, we love you. <laughs> we'll begin with the reading of the word. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. I have that on my, did my PowerPoint not work? And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Moving down to verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As I was praying today, God, I thought of all the ways that you love us, and I was praying for this word today, and I felt impressed with something I never had even thought of before, but you said, love them with my word. We show love with flowers. We show love with gifts. But today, we can also Show love. I want to show you love through the gift of his word. Love them with my word was the prayer that God put on my heart today. This is Mother's Day 2015. And I have kind of a different message. And as Pastor mentioned, I was not expecting to speak. Uh, but on Monday, the Lord just started dropping some thoughts on my heart and I just started writing them down and pulling scriptures and looking up tidbits here and there and 
And so I wasn't surprised when he asked me to minister, and I already had the direction from God. And the message that I want to share today is not like a, a marshmallowy, fluffy, don't love your mama message, but it is a, a lessons from Mother Eve. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from Mother Eve, and they're not just for ladies. They're not just for mothers. They can help us. They can help you. Now, some would say that when it comes to creation that, ladies, God saved the best for last. <laughs> right? Milton wrote about Eve in Paradise Lost, calling her, O fairest of creation, last and best. And you've probably heard what God said after he made Eve. Practice does make perfect. <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> I know that God does all things well. But he does have a perfect plan and a perfect way that he works. So before we get into looking at the scripture, I was fascinated with some information that I read this week about. Who has heard of mitochondrial Eve? Have you heard of mitochondrial Eve? In 1987, there were some studies done, and they took samplings from all the races of people all over the world, and they broke down the DNA, and they discovered scientifically that every person in the world was a family member to some other, every other person, and that they all originated from the same mother. And they called her mitochondrial Eve, because the DNA... Is called mitochondrial DNA. It's scientific. I'm not a scientist, but I, I found it very interesting. I was sharing this with my family today that the scientists could not accept this information, many of them, to be true because Eve would be too young and it just didn't work with their theories of evolution. So the science was saying that Eve was younger than their th unproven theoretical theory. And so they were going to stick with what they had conjured up rather than what the science was showing. And originally, they thought that she was 100 to 200,000 years old. But guess what? New studies have revealed that the mutation of the mitochondrial cells, however you say it right, happens way faster than they thought. And guess how old mitochondrial Eve is supposed to be? 6,000 years. Now that might not bear witness with the record of the scientists and their theory of evolution, but what does it bear record to? The Word of God. The Word of God. I have never known it to be disproven by science. Science has only proven this to be a reliable source in every way. We have a truth that we can hang on to, the biblical record of creation. So we're not talking about fairy tales here today. We're talking about facts. Now let's go to the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We learn from Eve that women, like men, share in God's image. He made them in his image, not just Adam. We reveal the feminine qualities of the character, attributes of God in different ways than men do. Most men aren't natural nurturers and comforters and things like that. God made women in a different way, but with the same essence that he made Adam. And it all reveals part of his nature. So we need to embrace that we are different, but we also are made in the image of God. We share with the world different attributes and characters of characteristics of God's nature. 
We read in Genesis 2.23 that Eve was taken out of man. Now, you're not going to take something out of me, and it's going to be different than me. Even if you refashion it and reshape it and make it into something else, I'm still a part of that. And Adam and Eve, Eve was a part of Adam, and she bore his essential nature and character as well, even though she was different. She was designed by God to be Adam's perfect mate, perfect mate, spiritually and intellectually, his perfect companion. Adam and Eve were both given an assignment from God. And we read about that in Genesis 1. What were they supposed to do? They're supposed to be fruitful. They were supposed to fill the earth with people and be keepers under their rightful God-given authority to rule over everything, everything in the land, everything in the heavens, everything everywhere on this earth was given to them, made by God and given under their authority to take care for them. God gave them every plant and every seed and every fruit. And then he looked back over it all. And what did he say? He, he didn't say it was good. He said it was very good. If you look that up in the Strongs, it says exceedingly, abundantly good. What God made was excellent, very good. And God made a beautiful world. So if you're not familiar, if you're familiar with the Genesis story, you probably know that the first thing that God said was not good was that man should not be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, how would God know this? Of course, God knows everything. But I also believe that God knew it from personal experience. Where in the universe was God's equal companion? There wasn't one. God had no companion, so with love, and I believe with a bit of excitement in his heart, God made Eve and presented her to Adam, and I think they were all smiling. But did you notice in the scripture we read that both Adam and Eve were given authority over the things in the world? They shared in the responsibilities. They had a co-mission that they were called to do together. That was God's original plan. That was God's original plan. It's obviously clear that they could not fulfill all the work of God independently because Adam could not fill the world with children on his own, could he? But neither could Eve. They were mutually dependent upon each other to fulfill the will of God. That's the way God made it, and that's God's picture of a marriage. Well, I know that not everybody here is married or has a child, and I, I don't want to even focus really on this procreation part of Eve's nature, this one aspect of her name. Her name does mean life. She is the mother of us all. Every one of us here is a daughter of Eve. But reproduction isn't the focus of this message, even though it is Mother's Day. <laughs> In the New Testament, we learn that there are not one Adams, but there are two. The first is a natural Adam, a man, and the second Adam is Jesus. And the Bible is a love story, is it not? If there is an Eve for Adam in the garden, in the natural world... I believe there's an Eve for Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Don't you? Hallelujah. God gives us the natural example before he reveals the supernatural to us. He's always used parables even back in the Garden of Eden. If we will have ears to hear them and eyes to see them, we will discover them even in the book of Genesis. And I believe that Eve is a natural representation of the spiritual bride of Christ. And that includes you. And that includes me. Everyone who is a member of the true church of Jesus Christ. From the moment of her arrival in Eden, God used Eve to introduce concepts, relationship, friendship, and marriage into the world. As the first lady, Eve represents many aspects of womanhood. 
and we'll look at some of them, but keep in mind as we do the spiritual application to the church at large. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. When Adam first saw Eve, he didn't give her a name right off the bat. Did you notice that? Woman is not a name. Think about it. That's what Adam did. He identified all the species. That was his job. Woman was not her name. It said who she is. And I read in an excerpt from a book called All the Women of the Bible that the word woman means like man s, like lion and lioness. It's man and woman. Woman is like the man s, the lioness for the lion. And as Adam's role with all of the species and, and, and naming all them, I just thought that was really neat, that, that that's what that literally neat means. And so he didn't name her at first. He identified her, and he identified her in relationship to himself. She's mine. <laughs> She's mine. The lion, he's got his lioness. Oh, yeah, but now I got me a man s. And isn't this wonderful? Hallelujah. Don't you like God's plan? Eve was created to be in relationship with Adam. And there are some things about us that are never going to be like natural Eve. She wasn't born of a physical mother. She didn't enter the world through a womb. But she was created by God. But think about that in relationship to the bride of Christ. Because we don't become the bride of Christ just because we were born of a woman. We become the bride of Christ when we are born again by the supernatural work of God in our lives. We are reborn by the very Spirit of God. Born again, not made through a womb of a woman. Eve knew what it was like to be sinless. Can you imagine well, you should be able to imagine because do you know why? Although it is hard for me to grasp this, that is how Jesus sees his saints. Sinless. I am so aware of my flaws and shortcomings that I don't always realize this. But what does the word of God say in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1? It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation because there's no guilt. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. Not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Jesus sees us as innocent. But did you notice that two-letter word that is so important? In Christ Jesus. To be free from condemnation. Condemnation. We have to be cleansed from our sins. And the scripture clearly states in Revelation 1.5 that Jesus washed us from our sins in his own blood. How do we get washed? How do we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives? So we can be free from condemnation guiltless in the eyes of God through the waters of baptism in his name. We have access to the blood of Jesus. Baptism in Jesus' name changes our relationship by bringing us into Christ. We are not the same anymore. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 27. For you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. God doesn't see my imperfections anymore. He sees Jesus. He sees the covering of the blood. He sees the pure sacrifice, not me, not my flaws, not my imperfections. He sees innocence. And that's the way I should see you. And you should see me. But did you notice the word for in Galatians 3.27? It connects it with the verse that was before it. It lets us know that if you are a child of God by faith, that it is connected with being baptized 
and putting on Christ. Something amazing happens when we go down in Jesus' name. The blood is applied. The blood is applied. Just like they took the blood in the Passover and they dipped it in the bucket and they put it on the doorpost through the waters of baptism, the blood is applied. And we are hidden away in a secret place with God, protected from death, protected from destruction because of the blood covering of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One of the most popular Old Testament verses, a powerful verse in Exodus chapter 12, 13. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's going to come a judgment on this world, but when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We are safe. We are protected. We're in the secret place of the Most High when we are in Christ Jesus through the waters of baptism in his name. I once wrote something that I believe is theologically correct, but I really do believe that God sees his saints repented, baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost as innocent as he saw Adam and Eve in the garden. Can you see yourself that way? That is how God sees his beloved bride, spotless, without wrinkle. That's how Jesus sees his bride. Baptism not only covers our sins, but it brings us into one body, the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 says that. And in 1 Corinthians 12.13, it says that we are all baptized into one body. Well, what body are we talking about? We're talking about a love story, right? We're talking about the first man, Adam, and the second, first woman, Eve, and the second man, Adam, Jesus, and the second, the bride. I'm calling her a spiritual Eve. That's who we're talking about. There is one body here. Now, I have to be un honest and say I haven't completely wrapped my brain around the differences, if there are any, between the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. From my understanding, I, it seems to me that it's all the same person. Um, because, like uh, God, we call him the eternal father, the prince of peace. You never talk about, hear about the body of Christ in the same verse in a contradiction to the bride of Christ. I believe that they're showing different aspects of the church. The body aspect shows us that we're all connected together, all of us believers, and that the bride aspect reveals how the church is destined to be Jesus's intimate love, his perfect companion and counterpart, symbolically his Eve. It's a love story. Another lesson we can learn from Mother Eve is that Eve was the first woman to ever face off with Satan. And she was in paradise and she blew it. So I think one of the most important lessons that we can learn from her is don't engage in conversation with the devil. Just don't talk to him. I don't need to hear anything he's got to say. Don't entertain any thoughts that are contradictory, contrary, or twisting this word of God because doing so is not going to take you down a right path. It's going to lead you in a wrong direction. I want to be going the right direction. We're not going to take the time to read about Eve's confrontation with Satan. You can read it in Genesis 3 on your own, but something to think about. This is paradise. There's no sin, and Adam and Eve aren't afraid of any of those animals. That serpent presented as a friend. Eve wasn't afraid of that snake, and she shouldn't have been. She wasn't afraid of anything. They weren't afraid of those animals. Satan presented as a friend. And the word tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15, that even today, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And that his servants, the servants of the devil, they masquerade as servants of righteousness. We have to be so careful about the voices that we listen to and those that we're letting influence our lives. Did you ever notice 
that he tempted her with something that he presented it to be an upward thing for her. She was going to be gaining something if she did it her way, if she did this thing that fed her desires. He portrayed the transgression as an upward step, but instead of taking her higher, it brought destruction, disease, death, and judgment. Never forget that Satan is a subtle and a cruel deceiver. And what he offered to Eve on a false premise that it would advance her and be in her best interest, it was a trick. And he is still using that same tactic today. It's important to learn from Mother Eve not to lose sight of all the beautiful things that God has blessed us with. If we allow ourselves to become discontent and feel sorry for ourselves, we are opening up an entry point for sin whether it be from the devil or just our old sinful flesh. Because guess what? We're all still living in flesh. And it still wants to be the boss of you and me. Have you ever had to tell yourself? I've, I've told myself this more with emotions, but I guess emotions can be a part of the package here. I'm like, emotions, you are not the boss of me. Flesh, you are not the boss of me. I'm going to tell you what to do. We are not going to let anything undermine our trust in God. He's been good to us. Amen. We got to remember that. Another lesson to learn from Eve is this, that when we're faced with temptation, don't act on impulse. Don't act independently from talking to the people who love you. She was in a perfect relationship with Adam and a perfect relationship with God, and she didn't even talk to them about this decision. She just went for it on an impulse, and that's an important lesson. She could have prevented, very literally, a world of hurt. A world of hurt. And some have discussed whether Eve eating the fruit was an actual sin. It was certainly called a transgression, and it did have heavy consequences. But I think it's important to note that God never cursed Eve. He cursed the serpent. He cursed the ground. He gave him some really nasty consequences, painful consequences. But he never cursed his creation and Eve, and he never cursed Adam. He loved them. But what did he do? He stood there in the garden, and he made a way for him to get out of that mess. Thank you, Jesus. He never cursed them. I love how the Bible calls Eve a helpmeet for Adam. And, and being a helpmeet speaks of Eve's position and relationship. And we can apply this to the bride of Christ. And so much of the world women, they're not considered to be anywhere equal to men. They have less rights if they have any. In some cultures, women can be beaten, mutilated, and even killed if you're just not happy with them right now. But that is not God's plan. He created a partner, not a janitor, not a plaything, not a cook, and not a baby factory. When I think of help me, I think of how a wife is supposed to help her husband meet his full potential. And he's supposed to do that for me too, I believe. That's a help meet, not just a lunch packer. I read that the word help meet as used in Genesis 2.18 is an unusual word that likely indicates mutuality and apparently means equal to. So that scripture could actually literally be translated that God made Eve to be Adam's equal helper. And that's not to say that there wasn't an order of creation and that things haven't been altered a little bit afterwards in judgment. I just want to say this. I'm glad I have a man who's covering me. I don't want to have to make be the final authority on a lot of decisions. And some people think that God might have been just a little bit cruel to tell to put Adam under or Eve under Adam's authority, but have you ever thought that maybe he was protecting her? Did you ever think that that might be love? That God saw her weakness towards to lean towards that emotion and things and he put that 
staunch man over her to, to temper her and balance her and cover and bless her and protect her. Not because he's, I'm going to show you, but because he loved her. That's love. That's not judgment. That's love and protection. And I'm happy I have a Bill Wagner in my life. I find it very opening, eye-opening, that the word for helper used in the Bible, used in talking about Eve, is more often talked about God and how he was Israel's helper. And there is not one of us here today would think that God is subservient to his people. No, that's not God's intention. Woman was made to be so much more than she often understands. Another lesson we can learn from Eve is don't try to fix mistakes on your own. Adam and Eve, they sewed those fig leaves together, <laughs> and they made themselves aprons. And I could go on a tangent here and talk about the difference between the little aprons they made and the tunics or coats that God made, but we're not going to go there. What we're going to talk about, the main point I want to make, is don't try to hide or cover your sins with your own little fig leaf personal made aprons or excuses, because that's what they offered up. Only the sacrificial covering made by God, which included the shedding of blood, worked for Adam, and it's the only thing that's going to work for us. We can't make our own plan. We can't make something a little more comfortable. We got to go with God's plan. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says, let us it says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. I want to prosper, so I better not hide my sins. But whoso confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. I need mercy. I need mercy. I'm thankful those mercies are new every morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. One aspect of Eve I never thought about before I was preparing to speak today is that Eve was the first woman to ever suffer with the shame and the sorrow of being the mother of a murderer. And sometimes our kids can bring us grief. And what can we learn from Eve on this? The Bible doesn't tell us the whole story, but it doesn't appear she remained stuck in the tragedy. She bore more children, and she did live a long and productive life. Don't stay stuck in the grief. Adam and Eve were the first people to hear the incredible promise of the Messiah. In Genesis 3.15, God was speaking to the serpent when he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that's kind of old English. Let me break it down for you. These words of God are telling us that I'm going to put some hate between you and that woman. I don't know about you, any of you ladies like snakes? Just doesn't seem like a natural thing to me. But God was putting hatred between the snake and that woman. Why do you think he fights with us so bad? He fights with us women. And he said that between her family line and his family line, there, and there's a whole study right there, <laughs> the seed line of Satan and the seed line of Eve, and that's a fascinating study. But God was saying that the seed of Eve was going to crush his head. Right there in the very book of beginnings, God was making a divine promise that wove its way from the garden all through that Old Testament right to Calvary's cross when Jesus Christ cried out, It is finished! He finished that work that he promised in Genesis chapter 3, 15, directly in relationship to the fall of man and making a way for them to be back in perfect relationship with God. Jesus said, it is finished. He bruised. He was bruised, but he crushed that serpent's head and all the principalities and powers that were brought into the world by Eve's transgressions were put under the feet of Jesus. It is finished. 
Hallelujah. I'm excited. I had a good time working on this message. I just have to stop and throw my hands up in the air and say, Woo, God, you are so good. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for how you've kept us all of these years. He loves us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, your word is a treasure. Your word is beautiful. You are beautiful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Adam was a figure and a type of Jesus. And like Adam slept in the garden, and from his side was taken that rib. There was fashioned a bride from his side. And in John chapter 19, verse 34, we read of the piercing of the side of Jesus. Like Adam, Jesus was already asleep. He had already surrendered his spirit. And from his side, in that violent act, he was wounded, a holy wound that poured out life for me and for you. And from the side of Jesus, where the water and the blood poured out, it opened the door for the birth of the church. In John 19, 37, John quoted the prophet Zechariah when he said, They shall look on him whom they pierced. The whole prophecy says in Zechariah, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced. From the one who was pierced, poured out grace and prayers for favor by the only mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. In Zechariah 13, 1, we read that in that day a fountain shall be opened up. In that day a fountain shall be opened up. For the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And why was it open? For sin and for uncleanness. Jesus is that fountain. Blood dripped from the hands and the feet. Blood dripped from the pokes from the crown of thorns. Blood oozed from the stripes on his back. But the fountain opened. When in one last violent act on our beloved Savior, that Roman soldier took his sword and pierced his side and the blood and the water poured out and the fountain of Jesus was opened and the doorway of the church was swung open. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I loved how we opened with an old hymn today because I have an old hymn in my notes today. It's called Rock of Ages. And Rock of Ages tells the story of what happened on the cross. Jesus is the rock that was cleft. He is the rock from which poured out living water. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Hallelujah. And I know that some of these words, we don't even have a clue. I bet you young people are going, I understood about 50% of those words. I would like to explain what it means. It means, Jesus, you are the rock. You are the rock of all ages, from eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. He is our sure foundation. He is the rock that was in the wilderness where the water came out and sustained the life of the people of Israel. He is that rock of ages. Hallelujah. 
and he was cleft. That means he was split open for me. This is not an entreaty. Oh, God, be split open for me. He was split open for me. Oh, Jesus, that was split open for me. And from your side, a river of water and blood flowed out a double cure for all my sins and transgression that not only saves me from wrath, but makes me pure, a spotless bride, wrinkle-free ready for his presence aren't those powerful words that is what jesus did jesus you are the double cure for all my sin hallelujah because of mother eve and father adam people are born sinners how do you like to have that for a label <laughs> Oh, she was a born singer or she was a born musician. Well, you were a born sinner. Every single one of us were born sinners. And without the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, every one of us would face the wrath and judgment of God. Because every one of us is guilty. And not one of us is perfect. But like the old hymn says, there is already a cliff. An opening in the side of Jesus. And we access that through the waters of baptism. And we hide ourselves. We are in him. We have a hiding place and a way of escape. The Israelites during the Passover, they sat inside their blood-marked doorways and they were safe. And we have a place of safety. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's God's great gift. But we have to go to the fountain. We have to go to him. We have to go to the Savior's side that was brutalized for our salvation. Where we can be cleansed from our guilty stains. But when we do, we'll be able to go to heaven. To spiritual Eden. Where Jesus is preparing a place and anticipating his bride's glorious arrival. Hallelujah. Don't you want to be in the bride of Christ? I want to be in the bride of Christ. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 49, that the first man, Adam, became a living soul, but the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. The natural man came first, and then the spiritual. In verse 49, we read that it says, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, just as we've been an earthly person and borne the image of a human person, we will also bear the image of the heavenly person. We will be like him. We will be clothed in glory. We will be spotless and perfect because he made us that way so that he could have a bride, so that he could have a companion. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The greatest lesson we can learn from Mother Eve is that God, so aware of our frailty, made a way of restoration. And we can gain back through our obedience what Eve lost through her disobedience. When we respond to God's plan of salvation, when we repent, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, and when we are filled with that life-giving spirit. Hallelujah. When sin entered the garden, the glory of God departed. But through our lives of submission, the glory can come again. Through our obedience, the glory returns and we can be a part of spiritual Eve. You know, people, people will come up to somebody that's really been in prayer or whatever and they'll say, you're glowing. You're, have you ever seen somebody that was glowing? The glory comes back when we are obedient and when we are in relationship to God. We're just seeing through a glass darkly right now. But someday, someday we're going to be, we're going to be all covered all over in glory. <laughs> Hope when I was little, she told me I was covered all over in pretty. But one day we're going to be covered all over in glory. And one last lesson from Mother Eve is that a wrong done 
no matter how bad it was, and no matter how dire the consequences, even no matter how many people you affected with your transgression, that is not the end of your story. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God has made a way. And that way is through Jesus. And his word says that today is the day of salvation. And I'm going to turn this over to Pastor. But as I do, I want to personally invite you to come. I believe that's God's favorite word, come. Come. If you've never come before, you can come today. If you just have an anticipation for his coming, come today. And let us be partakers and recipients and joyous celebrants of all the wondrous, beautiful things that God has done to make a way for us to be in relationship with him. We are spiritual Eve. But don't forget the many lessons that we need to learn from her along the way. Thank you. We are such a blessed people in this house tonight. We stand with the blood of Jesus Christ as a canopy over us. And as Sister Lori was ministering this message, I just kept seeing myself on the pew as a child singing a song that we used to sing as I was growing up. And I didn't even really understand everything I was singing when I was a child but oh do I ever understand it now there is a fountain filled with blood how many of you are thankful there's a fountain filled with blood drawn right from Emmanuel who was Emmanuel Jesus Christ God with us drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunge that was me that was you sinners plunge beneath that blood lose all all everybody say all all their guilty stains. You may not know this. Some of you who've been around a while will. This might even stump some of you baby boomers. But you'll catch on quick. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. They lose all their guilty stains, lose all their. Guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Would you raise your hands and thank Him? We lose all our guilty stains. We lose all our guilty stains. For we're sinners plunged beneath that blood. And we lose all our guilty stains. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Oh, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power, for it reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows through the whole me strength from day to day it will never lose its power I just want everybody to raise your hands right now right where you are let's thank God for the power of the blood in our lives I want you to know this altar is open right now if there's someone in this house that you just feel like you need to reconnect with the Lord Jesus Christ. You feel like you need to just spend a little time telling him, thank you, Lord. Telling him, here I am, Lord. Would you just bathe me afresh in that fountain of your blood? Would you let that blood wash over me afresh? Maybe there's someone who's never even repented. You're here for the first time you've never made a start for God. Today is the day to make that start for God. Today is the day to become a part of that pride of Christ. Today is the day for you to come to this altar and let the Lord wash you and cleanse you in that fountain filled with blood drawn from his own vein. Today is the day for you to receive that fresh cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's your very initial cleansing, but the Lord is reaching. The Lord is loving. The Lord is here seeking to save that which is lost and to establish those of us that have already had relationship with him deeper into his blood deeper into his name, deeper into his spirit, for the blood and the water and the spirit agree in one for our salvation. You may have found yourself that you've drifted away in some manner from the Lord. This is the day to put yourself squarely back under the flow of Calvary's blood. He is the lover of our soul. He is not wanting to condemn. He is aggressively trying to save. He is an aggressive Savior, and he loves, and he cares, and he's reaching, and he's... He's reaching. He's knocking. He's saying, won't you respond to me today? Won't you let me set some things right within our relationship and in your life? He's right there knocking, reaching, drawing, wooing. What you're feeling in your spirit right now is the constraining love of the Lord Jesus Christ drawing you to himself. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day
its power. Oh, I want you to know that blood's reaching for you. He won't force it upon any of us, but he just offers it so freely and so willingly, so completely. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessings, blessings, blessings from Mother Eve. Blessings, blessings, so many wonderful lessons we heard from Mother Eve. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sister Michelle, would you come up here right now? I uh, failed to let you make that announcement. I got so into the service, I told you you could make it, and then I, the Lord reminded me that I forgot to let you make it. I appreciate the burden for the children. Aren't you thrilled the way God is filling up our Sunday school classes again with children? I'm telling you, God is bringing precious young married couples into this church, and, and we're seeing, I, 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 I'm thankful for the work that uh, Brother Brandon, Sister Laura McKenzie, and those are helping them are doing to bring young people into this church. Are you, how many of you are praying with me about vehicles for, for the children? Vehicles. Are you, hey, I need you to help me pray about that. Who will just raise their hands and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm going to be praying with you specifically about that. I believe we need to pray specific prayers before the Lord. Uh, that's one of my specific prayers I'm keeping before the Lord. I am so thankful for what God is doing. I prayed a circle maker prayer. I was on vacation, but I just was reading a book called The Circle Maker while I was on vacation. And I just began to pray a circle maker prayer for two things. And this was not quite two years ago. This is about a year and nine months ago when I was praying specific. Everybody, specific prayers. Specific prayers. And the specific prayer I was praying to circle.